Welcome to the first Ariga session um, this year, 2022. My name is Dirk Dürweiner. Um, today, Kasper Skipper will talk about his work. Kasper is a software developer and electronic musician. He studied sonology at the Royal Conservatory in The Hague. Um, he is a member of the Game of Life Foundation, an organization which manages a mobile wave field synthesis loudspeaker system. He has assisted in the technical realization of many projects by um, and collaborated with a whole range of composers. Um, and he's uh, the administering officer of the Research Catalog, an online platform uh, for, for the documentation of artistic research. Um, and uh, yeah, his work has been performed in, in the Netherlands, in uh, China, Spain, and various other places um, in, in Europe. Um, and he's going to talk about his work today. We're very happy that he's here, Casper. Uh, um, yeah, take it away. Yes, uh, thank you, Luke. And I'm very happy to be here. So uh, share my screen so we can get uh, started. Um, so can do we do I actually show my slide at the moment or? Um, yeah, great. Um, yeah, so um, today I'm actually uh, kind of interested to um, to talk a little bit about my own field of uh, of, of interest, which is uh, computer music. And uh, uh, yeah, um, after I finished sonology, uh, I mainly uh, have been active in the kind of field of live coding, live programming, um, and then but I still had the very uh, sonological approach of uh, um, doing that kind of live coding um, in the kind of non-standard approach, um, which is a kind of uh, yeah, which is a a, a, um, a method for uh, pro programming kind of audio and uh, hopefully music. Uh, and so, yeah, the kind of topic what what I'm today interested to to discuss with you is the um, kind of my experience in integrating a creative process uh, during the programming of a computer program and how I feel that there can sometimes be tensions in between mixing these two things. Um, but also that <clears throat> I think that there can be certain insights when you combine both the kind of <clears throat> creative process and um, and the more technical um, problem of making a computer do what you want it to, to do. Um, and so, yeah, I think to compare, it's very important to distinct, like uh, when I'm, for instance, programming for the research catalog, uh, it's very goal oriented kind of programming where you uh, are quite, oh, at least yeah, it should be quite clear what the program has to do. And there's a certain design restraints and you know that users have certain expectations. And so that is a very uh, goal-oriented style of programming. And um, yeah, with Luke uh, in the last two years, we uh, we actually also did some programming together. And I, I uh, also had the pleasure of learning a great deal from him in a way. Um, and together we studied kind of Elm, which is a very uh, nice environment to, I think, build goal-oriented programs in. Um, but I think, yeah, the programming that I do when I'm when I'm doing uh, audio synthesis or making programs in the field of music, um, it is much more a kind of generative style of, of programming. So um, I do not have a clear intention in mind that I want the program to function in a certain way, um, but it's much more a kind of search for the program while I uh, have a certain starting point, but during the, uh, the forming of the program also maybe my perspective on what I'm aiming towards might change uh, quite a bit and um, um, yeah my, my goal of or at least my, my topic of today is kind of maybe looking a little bit into that and, and seeing from the activities that I've done in the past and the kind of languages that I've used and programmed uh, how they fit uh, this kind of generative coding and maybe uh, if you could learn uh, something from that uh, experience. Um, so yeah, with, with generative coding, uh, there's not really a clear goal, but I see it more like you start with something, uh, a small idea, 
and uh, the, the at least for me, I want my program to produce something surprising. So uh, I want to explore areas that I didn't really. Uh, I want to actually generate uh, structures or even ideas that I didn't have when I started programming the program. So. Um, and that's quite different from like how I, for instance, programmed an Elm uh, in which I, uh, in which you often start with a very specific idea of what the program should do. Um, yeah, so one uh, uh, kind of uh, analogy that I recently came across that I kind of find useful to think about in this way of design, uh, these type of generative programs is the, a uh, generative algorithm that we find in nature. So evolution, which is of course a kind of uh, a popular thing uh, to, to reference. Uh, and I um, came across a very nice example of this in, in Neil uh, Shubin uh, book, Some Assembly Required, which I can actually highly recommend because it's a, it's a very entertaining book. And um, uh, so one kind of mystery that you find in, in evolution is that um, lots of organs or actually functional uh, parts of an animal develop um, before they uh, even before they seem to be useful so for example if you look to the development of uh, limbs in uh, in animals but also lungs and other uh, properties of that animal that are very useful on land uh, you find that these things actually surprisingly uh, have a much longer history than the animal actually being on a land environment. And so in some way, it's kind of almost reversed that um, uh, first the, uh, the animal develops some, some organ uh, that, that is uh, then turns out to be very useful when it's taken into another context. Um, and that's of course a bit of a mystery because uh, at least uh, what evolution theory tries to explain is how Kind of an aimless uh, process or algorithm can still have a kind of um, design-like and purposeful uh, result. Um, and so the way it's often explained is actually that that uh, the lungs and, and also um, feet um, actually have a function for the fish already. So they are actually quite useful for the fish to have lungs in, the, for instance, in the, in uh, water where there's less oxygen, it, it can use the lungs to kind of survive low oxygen environments. But then it turned out that if the fish also walked onto land, that these lungs are also very useful for that. And then uh, on that moment, of course, kind of the, the selection um, also helps that to, to even make that effect much stronger. Um, and uh, um, the, the, the lungs will become bigger and more efficient and all these type of things and maybe other uh, uh, properties will also develop and I feel that somehow I recognize this that this is often also how my programs sometimes develop that I I I, um, I do not have a, the end result in mind but during the process certain um, parts of the program um, are developed and then uh, I, I try to of course at each point improve it a little bit um, but often you can find that sometimes you can make a switch in context or you can make a kind of drastic change in the program that somehow um, can be quite interesting. And, 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 uh, uh, and so, uh, and somehow it seems that a change of context is actually um, allowing it to flourish the, the, the ideas that were in the program um, or it, it fails, which also sometimes happens. Um, and uh, yeah, then, so I think it's interesting if we talk about non-standard synthesis, I should of course mention uh, the influence that is very strong in, in Synology. Uh, so Gottfried Michael Koenig um, um, work that um, especially the, the SSP program that uh, he developed uh, at, at Synology when it was still in, in Utrecht. Um, and uh, um, in a way, what he at least uh, um, uh, so yeah, maybe it's also quite important to to stress what non-standard synthesis is. So, in a way, it's a, it's a type of synthesis where you do not have any uh, higher level description of the sound um, algorithm that you're generating. So you don't have notes or 
uh, grains or even uh, analog electronics that you're trying to simulate or physical models of musical instruments, but you approach sound like a uh, just an amplitude signal that is changing over time. And so in a computer, that means that it's just basically uh, a series of floating point values that you are generating. So it's a very low level kind of approach. And so in the SSP program that Koenig was also working with, uh, it actually combined uh, two parameters. So you had an amplitude value and a um, kind of time parameter. So for how long the amplitude value was told. And he then um, used actually the um, some of the algorithms from his instrumental composition programs um, um, in this kind of context of pure amplitude values. So in a way he did something similar to the fish go going onto land that he used an old um, set of techniques, but in a completely different context in which they were not designed to be used in a way. Um, and so I found that kind of interesting. And also in some way, uh, actually Luke has written a very informative um, article that also explores these aspects um, uh, quite well, um, is that some of those techniques also didn't work, but in another way, it also uh, generated an opportunity to have a, a really different approach to synthesis um, that was not existing before, uh, before he made that kind of context switch of the techniques. Um, so then we come to my own uh, experiment in a way like, uh, uh, which is called KISP. Um, and it, it was very influenced by also the AC toolbox, which was written by Paul Burke, but also uh, Luke's uh, comp scheme, which also used a similar kind of uh, uh, syntax. Um, but my aim uh, was really to uh, to kind of make something that would be live programmed um, and that I could also understand myself because uh, yeah, back in the time that Luke was doing this, uh, I was not such an advanced programmer yet. So I somehow wanted to make something myself so that I also um, uh, could understand more the kind of basic element of, of the how the program was written and, um, and, and kind of extend it. Uh, a bit more easily, uh, which uh, yeah, and for that I just had to write it myself. Uh, it was basically my my um, consideration. So um, now I should probably, if I just briefly stop sharing my screen and share it again, I can switch to and uh, share my sound here. And then I'm going to. Start to check. So um, maybe it's good to just kind of demonstrate what what KISP, um, how it how it works. So it works with a. Um, a syntax lamp from Lisp, and um, uh, yeah, there are many generators, but one I often use is the step generator, which basically takes an amplitude uh, and a time uh, value. And uh, yeah, in actually in many programs, I actually use a time value, which is one. Uh, and that means that it's just one sample. And then I basically deal with the generation of, of, of sound in the amplitude value. Um, Kasper, I'm not sure you're sharing the right file because we are seeing an ML. We're ah, okay, that, that is file. interesting. Ah, okay, that's not the, it's probably because it was so small. Thank you for noticing that. This is Lisp, I think. Hello. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, yeah. Um, so yeah, so we can actually play this. Maybe I make it a little bit softer just in case. So can you hear this actually? Yeah. And uh, yeah, so one of the properties of, of, of the program was that I wanted each parameter to be replaceable by another kind of uh, generator. So um, for example, if I want to um, modify the, the gain of, of this uh, noise, then uh, I can basically just 
insert another function there and I can make a line for instance. The sequence just reads these values uh, zero one and kind of repeats it infinite infinite amount of times. And um, ST is just short for like a static value. So it's just a way to get a static stream. So I think it's just take three seconds. And so it goes um, on and on. Now, of course, you can also make tables. So, oops. And that's actually one of my favorite things to do. So, make a table here and use a function to fill that with random values. So, then we get a static kind of pitch. Um, And we can then, I mean, what I find interesting is to, for instance, index the table with another function. So I could, for instance, one kind of SSP-like thing to do would be to have a random value that maybe be um, between zero and 32. But I could, for instance, make the top one a function bit like a, to actually modify that value so to get a more dynamic result. And then, for instance, choose from a list of values. And maybe while I'm at it, I can actually use that for both values so that it becomes a tendency mask just to honor the, the great uh, Koenig, which was unfortunately passed, passed away uh, just a few weeks ago. Um, and so, yeah. Ah, this is surprising. So, yeah, one thing that can also be done is then, of course, to refresh this a little bit. And um, actually make a line between two points. Now I get a syntax error, which is because line doesn't expect so many arguments. So I have to do it a little bit differently. Actually, I have to do it like this. And yeah, that would be kind of a basic demonstration. Um, and um, But the idea is at least that, that each of these kind of elements can be easily replaced by uh, another function. And there's of course, uh, yeah, a mod lot more that, I, that, that can be done, um, but maybe that would be a bit, bit much for like a first um, endeavor into this. Um, into this type of thing. Uh, one thing I've explored quite a lot is the idea of having certain walks. Um, so a walk basically means that you have a kind of start value and then you use another stream to, to kind of uh, modify that value. So a very simple way would be to have a walk that starts at zero and then uh, there's a kind of random walk. Um, but I found also that it can be quite interesting to actually have uh, kind of more structural movements in the in the steps. Um, so and then Correct, but um, I'm just 
indent this a little bit so that I actually understand this a little bit better. Ah. So yeah, there's always like improvement necessary to get actually interesting output. Ah, there we go, sounds a bit better. And yeah, that would be a very basic uh, <clears throat> demo, <clears throat> but just to give you an idea, I mean, this is a bit more advanced program. Uh, that generates much more diverse output. And actually, uh, you cannot see this, but um, part of the program is controlled by tables. Okay, so I think I should continue not to uh, get too stuck on this. Um, let me turn to my presentation, which of course. So I'm back in my presentation now. Yeah. So yeah, what I just demonstrated is that the process is often that I write a small program that generates sounds and then static parts of the program are replaced with dynamic ones. And at some point the program becomes interesting. And so then I often make a copy just to save it kind of for later usage and uh, I develop it, it further. So uh, yeah, that's kind of the, 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 the way it works. I mean, of course, you can also write an output into a table and then use another program to read from that. Um, and uh, it can be also be quite interesting to use actually the sound output as an input to control um, to control certain aspects of, of, of other programs to almost, um, I always think of it like using the signal of the output kind of like an, uh, uh, a symbolic <clears throat> program itself that you then execute. Um, uh, in 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 another program, and we had the demo. So yeah, not to get too much delayed. So recently, um, because of my encounter with Elm, I tried to move all of this to OCaml, which I did kind of uh, successfully, and it had certain advantages like uh, being fast, but that I find not so super important somehow. Um, but more what I found is that um, um, is that I got much more insight into kind of um, the structure of of this kind of non-standard synthesis that I was trying to attempt. Um, so uh, which sometimes helped and meant that I could write much more complex programs as well with it. Um, and I found a certain flexibility also in dealing with media inputs um and other types of input um but um compared to kisp it also tended to make programs much more um strict somehow or um less or actually more resistant to change so with kisp it's very easy to replace parts of it because everything has kind of the same shape and it's all floating points uh, streams uh without any typing or even like uh structure within them they're all the same structure in a way and i found that they were very rewritable because of that but with ocaml it's somehow slowing down a little bit the, the rewriting um of it so um and i think it has something to do with that um that it was somehow more becoming um um a goal-oriented type of programming um instead of something that is um, uh, 
um, ambiguous. Um, at least the parts that formed the program were not completely defined down to their specific purpose in, in the bigger whole. So they were not uh, so specialized that they become that I couldn't move them around anymore or simply apply them in a different part of the program. And so, yeah, my, my kind of uh, questions that I now deal with is, is the idea that maybe um, I should build again also for the, the OCaml version, a kind of Lisp interpreter that hides a little bit uh, or that it makes it more ambiguous again, uh, the, the streams in the program so that I can, um, um still have the complexity and don't have to maintain three languages because uh yeah i didn't really show this but uh because i wrote just kisp um in an early stage of also understanding compilers it's actually um taking that syntax that you saw putting it through a python program that translates into chuck code and then the chuck code is executed by chuck uh, and which means that whenever i wanted to add an extra function i had to write it in three different languages sort of and represent it and have all these translations happening um which in the end made a very nice interface but it meant that like adding new functions to it was actually quite uh, slow and cumbersome and in OCaml of course because the synthesis and everything is happening in the same language i i much less have this kind of limitation um, um but yeah it's still a bit of a question like um 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 how can i have the the complexity without sacrificing the ambiguity that sometimes is very fruitful uh when programming in this kind of haphazard uh on the fly uh way and uh yeah in a way that is that is also a question i would open up um to the to the audience and i think i sort of reached the end of my story. Thank you, Kasper. Thank you for this uh, presentation. Uh, maybe I can start with a question while mm -hmm. people are kind of thinking. Um, like, I mean, we've talked about this and we've shared a lot of the development of, of some of these things. I mean, um, like especially the OCaml stuff and I know how, how a lot of these things evolved. And um, so there are some, I think there may be some things that we've talked about that may be also nice to kind of share maybe with the people. Like one thing I think that we've, uh, I mean, it came, comes to mind like when I thought about your, your programs and, and also our like, when we when we program stuff together in Elm or other other languages like that, mm -hmm. um, so just to say, Elm is like a kind of Haskell, basically, uh, well, it's like a subset of Haskell. Um, and is that is actually time? So what I wanted to say, like, uh, if yes. you go from like something, if you think of something like Max MSP or Pure Data, like what you build is like a kind of it's almost like a clockwork kind of thing like it's executed in time you have to think about time when something flows into something else and so on it's very much in the code then if you go to some kind of stateful normal let's say programming language there there's also this kind of computation some variable changes its value it's read by something else so that it's there's somehow a little less time because you can abstract, you can write a function and so on. I don't know, in C or in JavaScript or in SuperCollider. You can write functions, you can write classes. They are somehow outside of time, but then once you activate, once you do some something with them, they have like temporal states and then they are passed around, they're manipulated and so on. And then if you go to, to Elm, Hask, uh, Haskell or, or OCaml, although OCaml is a little bit in between these things, but mm -hmm. um, you have in a way no time anymore um yes like uh it's completely gone like you don't have really this idea of sequence of computations no. um it's completely atemporal the way you describe it which gives you that incredible guarantee that your program will always produce the same output you know if you are if you have the same input <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. and and so on and which makes uh i think programming in this what you say in this kind of purposeful directed goal direct oriented way very efficient actually because mm -hmm. once you are able to formulate stuff like this it will work you know you get rid of 
like many, many, many bucks and so on. Yes, uh, yeah, absolutely. The I mean, just to be absolutely clear, if you ever have the the um, if you ever have the need to write something indeed goal oriented, please, please do not do it in 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 a non strictly typed language because I at least over the past two years. I've really experienced that it's such a huge benefit to have these guarantees. Um, but it also made me think like, I mean, in a way I also found that even porting that to this more creative coding that there's many benefits, like I could write complex parsers and I made, for instance, a very nice thing that dealt with MIDI input of a friend. So he would send me random MIDI things and I could almost parse that like some kind of program itself and, and do very complex things that, that would, really not uh, i mean you would go insane if you would try to do that in chuck um because of the given complexity um uh, but indeed it becomes um uh, harder when you uh, want to have something that has some kind of sensitivity to time um and the program itself doesn't is no longer something that you think of as performing something like it's no longer like changing it's not like a musician or it's like somebody who performs who does an action and is in a current state and then reacts to what's happening you are you are really um yeah so, uh, so that kind of there's something that is no longer that in a way computational somehow but it's it's uh yeah it's a much more formal description in a way rather than than this kind of um, temporal execution of something and that um is something i mean that i have like i've kind of turned to rust in over the last years because it gives you the same guarantees but it's all like computation uh you know state for computation with these type mm -hmm. guarantees and i think the reason was that i wanted to be in that and the i mean the the streams that you use they are in a way getting stateful computation into these functional languages that is precisely what yeah. they are doing right yeah yeah and actually i didn't show that in in my demo but um there is actually also ways to to take a function and kind of execute it in almost also in a non-standard way in the sense that um they are scheduled um in time so i can have a function that for instance um writes into a buffer or replaces a buffer or actually even changes the network of uh, which function is is controlling the frequency or which function is um and um, um so in that sense i i guess you can also reintroduce all that kind of state in a functional language but it, it takes more uh, it's less intuitive and uh, in that sense, I, I did became aware also in preparing this talk that even if something is still possible, if it's just harder, it it becomes less obvious to do it. And um, these nudges are stronger than I think we sometimes underestimate how strong the nudge of a language can be uh, if it's not. Um, and especially, I mean, in the type of programming that I do with the system, which is very much almost an improvisation where um, I'm really almost not so quite conscious of how the bigger form of the program is developing. I mean, I'm kind of in a local part of the program. I'm replacing, rewriting that. And uh, maybe often if I look at the program like uh, I'm now showing, I mean, I, I would have to take some time to actually understand what, that, what was my intention of that program. Uh, but that's fine, I guess. I mean, the the program does, does kind of, um, take me into a place that i would not be able to do if i were to if i would have to write it in vanilla chuck because it would just uh yeah be much more diverse in its syntax in a way um yeah Is there anyone else who has questions for Casper? Dan? Yeah, I, I just, um, I, I kind of posted briefly because I didn't want to interrupt the discussion that was going on, but I was really intrigued by that 
by that point that you 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 seem to raise that you were talking about being nudged in different directions by the structure of the languages that you are writing in, which mm -hmm. I find I find kind of super interesting, and also I find a challenge all the time to to try and discover where is this tool secretly trying to take me, or where am I subconsciously being led by it? And I was wondering what you found that was different, kind of philosophically, when you think about the kind of things that you're making or the creative exercise um, that's going on that's different between these different approaches that you've you've highlighted. Yeah, well, I think one thing that is very clear that, I mean, although there are other languages, for instance, like SuperCollider has a very excellent uh, demand rate uh, set of eugens that you could use to do very similar things to what I've just shown. Um, but I find that the, the ability to define your own concepts and name them uh, and make them very fundamentally part of the language, um, I, I think that gives a certain freedom that that uh, you cannot get in another way somehow. Um, um, uh, and it's, yeah, it can even be as simple as, as the name of, of a function, but... Um, um, uh, but also the fact that you are the one that are, is writing it. Um, um, I mean, I do find that if I really feel like I, I want this to be like this, then I can go into the language and I can change it. And that is more difficult if you are dealing with a system that you do not fully understand or have not written yourself. Um, it depends a bit on language. Some languages are more, I mean, like actually the scheme... Um, Kind of syntax is in a way makes it very easy to define your own terminology because the um, uh, so there is there are differences there um yeah i'm not sure if that completely answers your question but yeah i i think so i mean some of this is i mean i'm intrigued by about what it is to work with powerful tools and the, the more enabling a tool is the more constraining it is because somebody else has designed in it the kind of things they think you might want to make and the other bit that intrigues me which is much more general is like uh the the sapir wharf hypothesis named after two linguistic researchers who says that uh there's this argument about does language structure how you think about the world and and there's a lot of argument philosophically about if you speak you know as a, as a human being a different language you actually have a completely different conception of how the world is organized. And there seems to be a lot of evidence to support that hypothesis, that the vocabulary and the structures and the tenses and the associations between the structure of the language actually changes how you think about the world. Um, and it's kind of intriguing to see what other people's experience of this is like with different kinds of tools, especially where you're making something that, as you say, is not so goal oriented and is much more exploratory. Yeah. Uh, so I have a question. Um, maybe it's not a question, but maybe you can talk a bit more about the uh, performative aspect of these programs. How do these work in, I mean, is, I, I assume that there is a, a, a situation of performance of these. Uh, the way I see them, it's like you, you're putting um, sort of a, a bit of a static kind of uh, sonic world into each of these uh, code snippets. And um, I'm curious about how you work with this in the sort of the uh, performing situation or be it live or uh, if you, you know, render some output and then you put it in a record. Um, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. I, I think that's a very good question. So I have... Um, I mean, I've, I've mostly, mostly used it uh, more like a kind of compositional tool myself. Um, so then it's not very performative. I think it's, um, uh, I mean, there are certain ways in which you can use it. Um, uh, for instance, you can actually take, um, you can define also streams that would run in between multiple um basically runnings of the program so you can run multiple programs uh, in parallel 
and then for instance uh, define that uh, yeah the a very simple way um so if i take a step gen and a say for instance um, nah. um, Some table that I'm reading from, and I, 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 you can you can actually define like, for instance, the the thing that actually defines the speed at which I'm reading in an external file that I can then so while while it's playing I can change that that uh, um, that part of the program and replace it with another part without the sound having to stop or this type of thing. Um, um, but I must say that the, yeah, it's 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 a bit uh, um, risky, and somehow um, I enjoyed more. I mean, it would be interesting to make an interface that makes it somehow safer. So one thing that I've been thinking about is actually moving the whole uh, interface a bit more backwards to an even older uh, inspiration, which is the Acer Toolbox, which just has has kind of slots. Uh, it often has a kind of um, um, interface with um, with fields in which you can paste functions that then generate parameters. And I think it would be interesting to have indeed a kind of static set of buses or even a kind of spreadsheet or something like this in which you can then, um, uh, uh, so that would make it easier to keep track of the state because one of the dangerous things is like, um, especially if you're dealing like in a command line situation is that you might replace like an essential part of the program and uh, it becomes more difficult. So I've been a bit scared to, to really uh, dynamically uh, replace parts of the program while it's running. Um, yeah, so. Yeah, just a bit of a small follow up. Uh, it feels like these are, uh, you, you could probably, I don't know, imagine them as, uh, I don't know, modules of a, of a rack. Mm -hmm. If you have this sort of analog um, synthesizers background. Yeah, with the difference indeed that, uh, <clears throat> um, yeah, as long as they, uh, uh, I, I guess that one of the differences is that that you could even like I, I mean if I wanted to make it really dynamic I would also basically want to change uh, the kind of behaviors of functions so that um, I could replace the index uh, with linear interpolation with an index which is not linearly interpolated for instance or um, that in a way everything becomes dynamic. Um, um, but yeah, that, that requires a different interface than than something that is that is like a text interface somehow. That would, um, there are of course examples like uh, in, in graphics also where I think v -V 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 or however you pronounce it, it has kind of code in boxes that you can then just like MaxMSP kind of dynamically link while it's uh, while it's playing. So it could be something like that. Um, I, I guess I have another question. Yeah, sure. it's very interesting. Uh, mm. so you mentioned that you think of the output of these uh, uh, programs compositionally. Um, so you you um, how does that work? Like you, you generate your material and then you have a sort of a temporal formal conception on you create some sort of development um, because it, the way it you know the, the the sort of uh, way to go for this type of coding it's like more like a sort of real time improvisation it's interesting that you mentioned that you you think of it as a compositional compositional tool instead of a mm -hmm. sort of live improvisation setting so maybe you can talk uh, a little bit on that if you if you want um i mean i was most happy when uh 
Uh, I mean, I do also sometimes find it quite interesting to to have the output as the of the program kind of as a challenge to then so to not edit edit the output to make it fill uh, fill my um, but more like take that output and then find how how the pieces can fit together in a in a composition without manipulating it somehow like uh, somehow redoing it. Um, um, and in a way, even kind of just um, uh, if if I were to uh, uh, combine things, do it in a way that kind of makes sense for the program to would almost do it itself if if it would be possible to do it somehow. So um, uh, But yeah, I, I I just enjoy too much as a composer, I guess, to to also I, I just enjoy very much this kind of the the timing or or this type of editing is is still um, um, yeah an enjoyable practice somehow and deciding how long a gap needs to be or what layers fit on top of each other. Um, but I try to start with the material. It's it's not that. Uh, that I then um, constantly go back and forth between that um, making material that would somehow fit into some uh, the progression of the piece. Um, yeah. Daniel, can I can I ask you a question? It was kind of I, this is jumping to a completely different area of topic, hmm. but I was intrigued by something you said was about time, which is sort of a, it's been a real interest and intrigue for me for many, many years. And I remember reading an article that Joel Ryan wrote. You hmm. mentioned that you'd work with him, I think at Synology. Mm -hmm. And he wrote this amazing article called Knowing When, which was about timing that mm -hmm. for him was the sort of the root of all of the things that he thought about, that, mm -hmm. that it was about this, specious but totally important moment and i was intrigued by his thinking about time and you mentioned about time in these different approaches that that some of the ways in which you were programming the environments was were very time bound and some were kind of released from being time and i wondered whether you could i'm not quite sure whether i'm going with the question but i was intrigued by that set of analogies and and links in there do, do you feel that there's different kinds of time going on in the different environments because it's producing sound it's producing music which is so implicitly I mean, time yeah, bound i think it's very important i mean the reason why i know i know very well that when i discovered chuck uh, when it was still a new thing to me that i was i was so glad that there was a language that finally uh, allowed me to 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 not have that distinction between like the control rate time and the audio rate time of the kind of um, uh, unit generator. So that somehow there was just a program and you could program it and uh, it was completely flat in terms of its concept of time. Uh, and I, I guess in that sense, I mean, although uh, non-standard synthesis often focuses kind of on that you generate the waveform, I think it's just as much about having uh, that the, the, the way the program is executed is, is kind of, uh, uh, is not bound by some vectors or uh, these kind of grids that you find in many other uh, systems, or even it is can be continuous. So that, uh, for instance, in many of my programs, it's not, not even so much the idea of events. Uh, there's all just basically signals. Um, and I, I, Indeed, most of the, the 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 when a program is interesting is when its timing is interesting, and I've I've done many functions to, um, like uh, not just randomly updating time, but indeed having an interesting way to compute time. Um, um, so time is very very um, very important. But uh, and and in that sense, also, 
um, I mean, Chuck uh, makes time very explicit because you you have to sort of tell the program to um, to let time pass in a strange way. So um, basically, that looks like a bit. Um, like you have your lines of code in a way, but you have to say like, uh, now time will pass. Um, so that was also quite important in a way, although my my uh, syntax um, hides that when you're programming it, um, all, uh, the, uh, all these functions like line, uh, but also, I uh, probably my most used function is timed. So that is basically a generator. Uh, and then um, another stream that controls the timing of it. Um, and yeah, in a way you could write a piece with almost only that, like uh, interesting ways to control that uh, part, I think. So, but it's like Luke said, in a way, timing um, uh, feels a bit foreign in, in functional programming languages. You have to um, you can only describe it somehow. It's not it's not um, it's not just a natural consequence. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, cool. I mean, you know, yeah, fundamentally, it's not re kind of really decided whether time exists in any functional way, but it's something that we endure throughout our lives <laughs> if they go in one direction. Yeah, thank you. That's really interesting. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. I, I should. Uh, do you know if that if that is that article online of of Joel or? I I was just looking up the reference for it because I was going to post yeah. it. It's I've got the. I need to. Pull it. It's from International Conference on Live Interfaces, 2014. I can post mm -hmm. the reference, mm -hmm. and, and now I can't remember whether it was recorded speech or it's actually a paper. Okay. Yeah. Um, let me paste it into the chat. Sure. I'm just going to do a quick search on my computer because thinking about it, I think it was an audio recording of a presentation he gave rather than a paper because I know, mm -hmm. I know he's not really written that much recently. No. I found the, uh, the, the proceedings. Um, okay. Um, I've just pasted the proceedings. I haven't yet searched for them. But... No. There is a, a, there seems to be a transcript of something, or like an, a discussion or something. I'll, I'll double check through what I've got here, but certainly that's the reference I've got pulling it out from my library, but I'll see if I can find the source and I can always put it into the Slack channel. Oh. Yeah, I found it. It's an MP3 file, so got to listen to it. Oh, great. Oh. <laughs> well, it's in time. That's, uh, that, I guess, the that makes uh, some kind of sense. Um, are there any more questions? So if there are no more questions, then thank you very much, Casper, for this great talk. Um, and the next one, um, some of them have been shifted and so on. You probably noticed that. And um, the next one is David uh, in two weeks time on February 8th. <laughs> he says no. <laughs> No, you sh you're shifting it. <laughs> oh, in in real time. No, it's, it's in one. real time. It's one. Yeah, I thought I'm it would be, but I wasn't sure. Yeah, but uh, I'm on the doodle. The doodle says one is February fifteenth. 
Yeah, yeah, that's me. So it's three weeks from now. Yeah. But February 8th, it says David. Oh, that's true. <laughs> so. <laughs> Damn it. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Well, it we seems that this uh, schedule is ambiguous, so. <laughs> it has changed meaning <laughs> yes. when it's interpreted. So, yeah. so, see you all in two weeks. And um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank okay. you very thank much. You. Okay. Thanks very much. Thank you. See you at the next one. See you next one.